Welcome back builders. In today's video I'm going to be showing you how the pre-built Highboy P7 electric compares to our DIY Swin Taff two-stroke. This is an electric bike versus a gas. Both bikes in this video will be riding the same path at similar speeds through terrible road conditions and severe weather. On paper, the differences between a gas and electric bike might seem obvious, but the goal of this video is to showcase the important differences between them in real-world situations. So whether you're new, still considering which option to go with, or heavily invested in one or the other, there should be some good information for you in this video. Three important things to keep in mind. First, I'm just giving you my point of view. Second, I'm not trying to change anyone's mind who might already be invested in one or the other. And third, my test sample only includes DIY two-stroke bike builds and pre-built electrics, mainly because those are what I have, but they also tend to be the most affordable and easy to obtain. Throughout this video, we'll be covering many subcategories while comparing these two bikes. And at the end of the video, they're going to all filter down into three main categories being practicality, enjoyment, and price. Let's quickly cover specifications of the two bikes so we can see what we're working with. The Swintaf carries a 2 liter gas tank which, depending on your gear ratio, can be good for 30 to 45 miles per tank. Integrated into the belly of the P7 is a 48 volt 15 amp hour battery which on their website claims to get between 30 and 60 miles depending on riding style. Based off of my own experience with similar setups, I would expect about 22 miles of full throttle operation and about 35 under moderate pedal assist. The power plant on our Swin Taff is a 66cc two-stroke. It's a Wildcat PK80 from California Motorbikes. The P7 sports a 500 watt geared hub motor of unknown origin. Both bikes are hardtails with front suspension and our Taff is sitting on 29 inch tires with the P7 sitting on 27 and a half. From visual inspection and riding experience, I can say that the build quality of both frames seems to be equal and good. The TAF is clearly designed as a trail bike, so it'll be at home where we're riding. The P7 is more of a commuter with light trail use in mind. Although the weather and road conditions that we're riding in are rough, I do not consider them to be abusive, and I expect both bikes to handle them with little to no issues. The electric because of its price, and the gas because of the time invested in the build. Our first category will be range, which for me matters a lot less than it might for you. In my opinion, any distance that you would consider using a bicycle to commute with is going to be covered within the range of both of these bikes. However, 
With the gas bike, getting more range out of them is as simple as carrying a larger tank. For instance, you can upgrade to a 4 liter tank which pretty much doubles your capacity for about $40. And yes, I worded that exactly as I intended because I'm catching out some of the electric bike gas haters that at this moment are about to write in the comments how you can easily upgrade the battery on an electric bike or add a second one to a rack if you don't care about a lot of weight. Yeah, you can do that. How much is that going to cost you, by the way? Mm, uh, $250 on the low end, $500 on the high end, depending on the quality of battery you get and capacity. That's a far cry from $40. And I'm not even going to touch on how much weight that adds to an electric bike versus carrying an extra 2 liters of fuel. Anyways, for me it's a mute point because about 98% of the riding you see done on my channel could easily be done on a gas or electric without worrying about range anxiety. Based off of my 5 years of experience riding powered bicycles, I find any bike that can get over 20 miles on a tank or charge to be more than adequate for an adventure or for practicality. What about safety? Well, I'm not going to go over every aspect of what could possibly go wrong in both situations, but here's my take on it. When you have a fuel leak, you can usually smell it, track it down, and deal with the issue. With an electric bike, they can have issues with defective chargers or bad cells inside the battery. They give you very little to no warning before they have issues. It happens very quick and is extremely hard to contain. It's important to never leave an electric bike charging unattended while you're asleep or out of the house. So this video must obviously be hating on electrics. No, gas, don't worry, your time is coming, I just haven't got there yet. If you stick with me long enough through the video, I guarantee that both gas and electric riders are going to hate me. Because I'm going to hit you with the blunt hard truth, whether you like it or not. Let's talk about power between these two bikes and how this also touches back on range. Now sky's the limit. Both electric and gas can have extremely powerful motors, depending on how much money you want to spend and how much risk you're willing to accept. However, most store-bought electric bikes are governed for legality reasons, with the P7 having a top speed of 25 miles an hour where the governor kicks in. The Swin Taff, on the other hand, actually rides at about the same top speed of 25 miles an hour, and if I keep it pinned wide open, we'll touch 30. Then, of course, with the DIY builds, you can gear them for pretty much whatever speed limit within reason that you're willing to accept, but there's some caveats and sacrifices. With legality and speed freaks both being cut off the extreme parts of the spectrum, let's assume a relatively safe and acceptable speed for the rest of the video, what these bicycles were intended to do. For me, that's between 20 and 30 miles an hour. Feel free to leave your hate in the comments, I will note it appropriately, but I'm only comparing the two-stroke motors to electrics because I find four-strokes to be too big, bulky, cumbersome, and annoying to deal with on bicycles. If that's your thing, great, I really don't care. Big advantage goes to the electric when you're talking about low speed operations, simply because they don't care how slow you go and they apply pretty much their full power at any given RPM range on the motor. They do have an efficiency curve, which is a bit too complicated to go in on this video, but for practical everyday riding it just doesn't really matter. Basically, the motor has no minimum speed as far as I can tell. I can apply the slightest power all the way down to less than a mile an hour. Yeah, that throttle resolution is really nice for when you're going through stuff like this. Tall grass, you don't know if there's going to be a random rut, pothole or whatever. Definitely not. Two strokes, on the other hand, actually have a minimum speed limit. This is because they're single speed bikes without a transmission. Here, my Swin Taff is running a massive 56 tooth sprocket for more practical low speed operations and better torque, but still, I find that I can't do anything less than about 12 miles an hour without the bike becoming super jerky and sluggish. Because yes, believe it or not, sometimes I just like to slowly cruise through certain situations. Not everything is just hit the throttle and go for me.
where generally the slower you go on electric down to a certain point, the more efficient they become and their maximum range increases. However, this is where the two-stroke really shines over an electric. The efficiency curve on a two-stroke actually goes up before it goes down. If you gear your bike properly, you can happily cruise at 25 miles an hour while it sips fuel for a long-range trip. On the other hand, with most store-bought electric bikes, 25 miles an hour is usually max or close to their max speed and really pulling some juice out of the battery. In general, you can expect most store-bought electric bikes to get about half of their rated range when you're cruising around at 25 miles an hour. Which brings us into power reduction over time, an area where the gas motors really shine over electrics. Electric bikes suffer from voltage sag over time, and they'll continue to lose torque and top speed as the battery depletes. Now, modern lithium-ion technology is pretty good about this, and if you're just using the bike as a commuter or relaxed riding, you don't really notice it. But if you're going for full performance, holding that throttle down all the time, you notice it a lot. On the other hand, a two-stroke motor has its full power available from the moment it reaches operational temperatures to the last drop of fuel. The peak power and efficiency curve of a gas bike can be moved all over the place with modifications and configurations, but on electrics it's pretty flat. When tackling steep hills I find the electric to be more predictable as it essentially tells you right away, hey this is all the power I got, here's what you have to work with. But it's important to remember that with electrics, the slower you go under full throttle, the more stress you put on the motor, speed controller, and battery. Applying full throttle at very low speeds while tackling a hill can be detrimental to an electric bike, so be careful. When it comes to tackling steep hills on a gas bike, you're generally safe to do so at full throttle. They'll either make it to the top or they'll stall out and die, but you don't have to worry about them pushing the motor past its limits they'll either give you the power you need or they won't have it. Let's talk about stresses on the bike itself. For too many reasons to cover in this video, putting a gas motor on a bicycle puts a lot of stress on the frame and critical components. On the flip side, converting a bicycle to electric puts a lot less stress on the frame and critical components, and even more so when you purchase a pre-built setup as they were designed to carry the extra weight and stress from the motor and battery. The major issues that plague a gas bike build are vibration and mounting point stresses. Electrics, on the other hand, generally just have to be built a little bit stronger to carry the extra weight and have better dropouts to handle the torque of the motor. And whereas higher speeds on an electric bike don't generally amplify the effects of its power system, on gas bikes, the higher speeds dramatically amplify negative effects. That's not to say you can't build a safe and reliable gas bike, but if you're going to start pushing higher speeds, you're going to run into reliability issues that are inevitably going to cause you to spend more money. As far as comfort goes, there's a lot you can do to both bikes to make them very relaxed and comfortable to ride. But if we compare two similar setups, the electric is going to win hands down. The lack of vibration and noise at any speed is pretty much what wins this category. Under low speed operations with the electric bikes, it's also a lot easier to be aware of your surroundings and hear traffic coming up on you. But I would like to point out a misconception I originally had about electric bikes, is that above about 15 miles an hour, the lack of noise doesn't seem to make a difference on hearing traffic approaching. It's simply because at this speed, the wind noise drowns out anything around you. Which is why on either of these bikes, had I used them for daily commuting, I would have a left side mirror on the handlebars. I place this in the comfort category because when you see things approaching, you'll feel safer. When you feel safer, you feel more comfortable. What about tuning? Well, with electrics, most everything is plug and play. You see, on the gas bike builds, there's this thing called tuning. And if you're new to it, it kind of sucks. There are a handful of things that can kill a two-stroke motor if you don't know what you're doing, and even more that just randomly pop up and are out of your control. Now what about maintenance? I'm not talking about the bike and frame itself, let's talk about the power system. Now for most electrics, they're pretty much a sealed system, meaning that there's very little, if any, maintenance to do. Occasionally you pull the hub and re-grease the gears, or replace them if necessary, but that's actually easier than cracking open a two-stroke. 
maintenance on the gas bikes goes a lot further. You've got an extra drivetrain to worry about, you've got the clutch system with all its intricate pieces, and then the top and bottom end themselves, which I'm not going into detail on, but I'll just say this. If you go with a two-stroke motor on your bike, you're going to need to accept a regular maintenance schedule, which in my opinion is part of the fun, but if you're just in this for practicality reasons, it's kind of annoying. And this brings us into entertainment value, which will depend on your personality. If you're an individual who loves to tinker, modify, hack, and try different random things, the two-stroke motorized bikes are perfect for you. These things are miles of fun to work on and kill time. Unfortunately, if you're somebody who's relying on reliable transportation and doesn't want to deal with a bunch of little issues, they're the worst possible thing you could try to build to get to where you need to be. It's a well-known fact throughout the two-stroke motorized bike community that you build these things as a fun hobby, and if they just so happen to be reliable, that's great. Chances are high when you build your first motorized bike that it's gonna be a nightmare and a money pit. It gets easier as you build more of them, and you can get to the point where you just throw them together in a couple of hours and they run great, but that's because of miles of past experiences, issues that you've ran into on previous builds. A fantastic representation of this hobby in real-world situations from an individual who uses them every day is Johnny's Motorized Bikes. A man who accepts the limitations, shows everything good and bad about the hobby, and continues to ride them. This is both because he loves the hobby and because he just needs the bike to work. So I suggest checking him out if you want to see what you're in for. Onto real world riding conditions. As you can see here, the P7 is blazing through some heavy rain. The electric bikes are getting really good at becoming waterproof, but they are a lot more risky to ride in wet conditions, simply because they have to be sealed to remain operational. These seals can be good, but if they're not, you have no way of knowing until there's a failure. For the gas bikes, they run great in wet conditions. As long as you don't suck water up into the intake, they have no problem riding through severe rain. That's not to say they're 100% risk free, but there's only two main electrical components on the gas bikes, their Magneto and CDI, which may be affected by water. The CDI is completely sealed unless defective, and the Magneto as well. I have a video, I'll leave a link in the description, where I took the side cover off of the Magneto and soaked it with a water hose and then proceeded to ride through a thunderstorm. But in short, the gas bikes just don't care. Ironically enough, the only issue I ran into riding these bikes through these terrible conditions was on the P7. Its forks did not like the wet conditions. Little bits of sand got into the forks through the seals from all the heavy rain and caused them to seize up. I had to go through a lengthy process of disassembling the front end of the bike and cleaning these out, re-greasing them, and putting them back together. It was the first time I ever serviced a pair of forks. To their credit, they were easy to do, but this being a $1,200 bike should have come with some better forks, or at least better fork seals. Two days later, after the bike had set up, I decided to open up the hub motor and see if any water got into it, because this could possibly be detrimental to its survival. Turns out, it sealed up nicely. I was impressed. On the High Boy P7, they did a pretty good job at making it so that water would drain away from any critical components. The speed controller is sealed and up tucked into the frame where it really can't get wet, and the battery has a lip on it that makes sure water can't get up underneath it. Most everything when I pulled the battery off was dry. As an extra precautionary measure, I added a silicone seal around the case of the hub motor and where the wire goes into the axle. I don't know if I needed to do this because it didn't show any signs of water getting in, so I think from the factory they did a pretty good job. Everything else on the bike still worked after this rainstorm, including the light, horn, and display. Nothing showed any signs of water integration. I'm just a little disappointed with the forks they used on this bike being so susceptible to the elements when everything else is sealed up so nicely. On to noise level. Well, this one's pretty obvious and we're not going to spend much time here. Electric bikes, for the most part, are whisper quiet. And you're not going to draw any unnecessary attention no matter where you ride them so long as you're allowed to be there. Big bonus on the electric bike, obviously. It's easier for me to talk to you guys. I 
I've gotten so used to doing voiceovers because of the motor noise that uh, it feels kind of weird trying to talk to you guys while I'm riding. <laughs> not gonna lie, I'm not used to it. lack of noise with electric bikes will also allow them to get away with things that draw too much attention to the gas bikes. For instance, if you decide to modify your electric to go a lot faster than is legal, there's less of a chance anyone's going to notice because they just don't hear it. This also means you can ride them whenever you want. Early morning, late hours, doesn't matter, you're not going to bother anyone unless you're doing something stupid. Because I use bikes as my daily transportation to and from work, I come home in the early morning hours when a lot of people are still asleep in close proximity to residential houses. On the gas bikes, this is something you could probably get away with a couple of times, but if you're going up and down the same streets every day around the same time, you're going to start annoying people. And when you wake up a newborn child, it doesn't make the parent a Karen to come out and start screaming at you. It makes them reasonably upset. More so, when you actually do encounter a true Karen, they're going to explode. On the electrics, they just never knew you were there. Now that's not to say you can't have a relatively quiet two-stroke. These stock motorized bike kits actually have a pretty good muffler that has a low chance of waking up your neighbors. But a lot of people just go straight to modifying these motors to the point where they make excessive noise. Moving on to price, which in my opinion is the most controversial subject when it comes to motorized bike transportation. Some electric bike enthusiasts will complain about gas bikes being annoying while not understanding that the individual riding it is on a tight budget and just trying to enjoy life. Some gas bike enthusiasts jump straight to complaining about price while not accepting the fact that some individuals can afford these more expensive machines and don't want to tinker around with the two strokes. To both of you I say, ride what you can afford and what you love. If after having watched this unbiased comparison video you still feel the need to complain about one or the other, you don't belong here, my videos are not for you. When it comes to price and affordability, the two-stroke bike builders suffer the worst possible situation in this hobby. Is that unfortunately, there are very, very few options for high-quality components. And if you do find a place that offers high-quality components for a reliable build, the price quickly rockets up to an electric bike. On paper, a new bike and motor can be put together by somebody with experience and made semi-reliable for about $300, sometimes less. But this initial price point is neither reliable or consistent. Due to this lack of quality options, the gas bike builds over time end up costing more than the electrics due to maintenance, replacement parts, and time spent working on them. Time is money. Never let anyone tell you that your time is not valuable. The electric bikes can have issues as well, and those issues can be costly, but they're a lot less common because of their simplicity. Moving on to legality. I know earlier in the video we cut this off, but only when it was associated with speed. Let's talk about the legality between these two bikes and what kind of attention they'll draw. Depending on where you live, and this is different everywhere in the world, you may run into issues with either one of these bikes. If you happen to live in an area where they just don't care what you ride or how you ride it, then this doesn't matter. But if you live in an area which is not very conducive to a freedom mentality, then the electric bikes are simply going to give you less trouble, as they're a lot easier to ride around on without getting noticed. And keep in mind, with the constant push of more places going green, electric bikes are going to be given a lot more freedom in their operation under public roads. For many builders, myself included, this is a sad reality, but make no mistake, it is reality. In closing, I'm going to sum up my final thoughts of what I think about gas versus electric bikes. To most of you, this will come as no surprise, but this is just my opinions. As long as you're not including time spent on the build, the initial purchase of a gas-powered motorized bike is miles cheaper than an electric. 
But in the long run, the money you're going to spend on keeping a gas bike running is actually going to outweigh the initial purchase of an electric. Power to weight ratio in any price bracket hands down goes to the gas bikes. They'll go further and they'll pull more weight. Price of replacement parts goes to the gas. Again, they're very cheap to fix, but they're time consuming and the quality of parts you're going to receive to fix them is not very good, again, unless you're spending money that closely brings you to the electrics. However, reliability, time spent on repairs, and fewer potential issues goes to the electrics. Also keep in mind that electrics are easier to store indoors because they don't have a smell and they're a lot less messy. But the freedom of storage actually goes to a gas bike. If you store them outside or in a shed, they don't care how hot or cold it gets. Worst case scenario, the gas goes bad and you gotta clean the carburetor, but she'll fire right up after that. The battery on electric bikes are picky about their storage conditions. To prevent damage, you need to store them in a controlled environment that's not too hot or too cold. And if you're going to store them for an extended period of time, you don't want to leave them at a full charge or a low charge. When dealing with issues on the road, I find the P7 to be a very easy bike to pedal if I ever ran out of battery or had an issue with the power system. Yes, it's a bit heavier than a bicycle, but trying to pedal a gas-powered bike that had a motor failure or a chain brake is almost a nightmare. I wouldn't want to be deep down a trail with either one of these bikes, but in the unlikely situation the electric was to fail, it'd be a lot easier to pedal out and get home without calling a ride. On my gas bike, which is much more likely to fail, if it has a critical failure, I'm calling someone to come pick me up. For me personally, I love the reliability and convenience of the electric bikes. The fact that as long as you've got a charged battery and air in the tires, you just hop on them and go. Due to their convenience, I ride my bikes even more often now that I have the electrics. I've made my best attempt to be unbiased throughout this video. My DIY side leans towards the gas bikes, and my reliability side leans towards electric. I can't say which one I enjoy riding more. The electrics have a broader scope of practical uses, and the gas, they just have more power for their size and weight. I've gone back and forth with both bikes through the video, but it's in my opinion that if there were higher quality components available for the gas bikes, the gap would be a lot tighter in more categories. And that's really the catch. They're so cheap and accessible because the quality of their components is so low. I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.